First question. In January, the news reported the probate juvenile court received a combined appropriations from the county and the state of just over $1 million for 2014. If elected, with a budget this size, what adjustments to personnel and programs would you implement in juvenile court? <coughs> Mr. Williams, you go first. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, and that's exactly right. The budget is approximately uh, $1.1 <coughs> The question then becomes, what does, what does the community want us to do for our children? We can certainly uh, achieve some economy as, uh, but with uh, staff and with some of the practices we engage in, but I'm sorry to say it takes a certain amount of money, it takes a certain amount of staff to run programs which we believe benefit children. Um, I will say that, uh, for example, and the best example I can give you is our drug court program, which has been around for uh, approximately 13 years. I've presided over that program for the last eight. And since the inception of that program, we have uh, received over $300,000 in grants to help that program operate, to employ staff, do drug testing, and the things that we think are necessary. So aggressive grant application is one area that I think that we can uh, really make headway in given that there's grant money and also looking at better ways to do what we do. Uh, if a program is effective, great. If it's not, let's look for something else and as stewards of the taxpayer's dollar, those are always considerations. So thank you. Thank you. Ms. Springer? Thank you. Um, one concern I have is Mr. Williams' literature states that he sup supervises a staff of 22 people. Um, that's a lot of people. Um, I know other courts in this county, um, their probation staff, the felony court has four. I believe the municipal court has three probation officers. Juvenile court has triple that amount. Also, there's the issue of the dilapidated building on Chestnut Street that I believe the commissioners uh, spoke, the commissioner candidate spoke about um, previously. That also needs to be looked at. Um, I'm all about fiscal and personal uh, responsibility, but definitely fiscal responsibility um, with your taxpayer dollars and uh, running that juvenile and probate court. Um, also, there's a matter that many of you may not know, but when uh, juvenile delinquents are sent to detention or juvenile jail, they're sent to Zanesville, which is approximately an hour's drive from here. There's closer facilities and that may be more cost-effective facilities that I think the court um, should look at. Um, I believe um, if I'm elected judge, one of the first things that I would do would be to order a top-to-bottom evaluation of personnel, policies, facilities and technology to see how we can streamline things and to make things more uh, cost effective for your taxpayer money so it's better spent. Thank you. You both addressed this in your opening statement and you both needed more time so this will be a good question. Can you tell us what qualifies you to be probate juvenile judge? And as I said you already touched on this but we'll give you some more time and uh, Ms. Springer you have two minutes. Thank you. Uh, we're, we're both attorneys, so we're long-winded, so I apologize for that in advance. Um, I'm a trial attorney. I was a prosecutor for eight and a half years. I prosecuted major felony crimes. Um, I was also, I started out as the juvenile prosecutor here in Knox County. Um, so for two and a half years, I was the one that was prosecuting juvenile delinquents in uh, the juvenile court. Um, I have the, the experience in front of, a, in a courtroom um, that I believe my, my opponent does not. Um, I, d I do admit he, he has been a, a judicial officer and, um, in, the, in the juvenile court. However, um, my, my quali qualities would be to, uh, to promote uh, personal uh, accountability for both children and adults and also um, to um, work with the probate court because I think we're all, which is a big responsibility in the, with the job, um, to help the citizens of Knox County pass along their property um, within, within how they want to have that happen. So I do have the experience both in the probate and juvenile realm and I think I would do a great job. Thank you. Mr. Williams. And the question is again. What qualifies you to be probate juvenile judge? 
I, I think I covered that pretty closely in my opening statement. Uh, ha having been on the bench for nearly 20 years, uh, having been the sole person who makes uh, custody child support uh, 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 visitation decisions, decisions that directly affect children and our families over that period of time. Uh, and I, I've, I've presided over every, every, uh, every type of case that this, this, our court offers. Um, I do want to make one comment in terms of, uh, of that, the, and Mrs. Springer, I think, has the right idea that we want to have judicial economy. But unfortunately, I, th I think the issue is misstated. Uh, she referred to adult probation. They have four people. That's an adult criminal model. The guiding principle of juvenile courts in the state of Ohio is to avoid the taint of criminality. And we firmly believe, I firmly believe, that running programs for children to try to make them more successful, be it drug court, be it study table, what have you, uh, that's only going to improve the, uh, our community now and in the future. Basically, the kids in elementary school, the kids in middle school, the kids in high school, they are the future of Knox County, and they are the children that we deal with. And you simply, you simply can't run a juvenile court and expect any degree of success if you're going to run it on an adult criminal model. So that, that's one place where I think my, my opponent and I uh, strongly disagree. So thank you. Thank you. Getting into a little more of the uh, juvenile side, define the biggest issue of our youth today as they appear in our court system. And then please describe how you would deal generally uh, with that issue or how you do deal with that issue from behind the bench. Mr. Williams. Probably the two biggest issues that we deal with in terms of children that come into our court um, are certainly drugs, which we see a lot of. We also see a lot of domestic violence. And as I've said many times, any of you who know me have heard me say, in some, not all cases, the biggest problem is not the juveniles, it's the parents. And if you don't have appropriate parenting, you're not going to turn out a good product, a broken mold, if you will. One of the things that we have done is we have finally found a program that we believe is working for parents of our juveniles called the Parent Project. We run them through that program. It's a 12-week program. It's not like an afternoon at the cafeteria. Uh, and we have uh, gotten some remarkably good results of that. Drug Court is, is specifically designed, our most intensive program, to address drug and alcohol addiction among our, among our youth. And we believe that it's a, a very successful program. It has been certified by the Ohio Supreme Court for its excellence and we want to continue that. There's a number of other programs that, that we could run, but again, um, drugs, domestic violence, and parents are the, is the triumvirate, if you will, that's keeping us from having a, a safe and stable community in all areas. Thank you. Ms. Springer, you have two minutes. Thank you. Um, I agree with uh, Mr. Williams that the, there's a big drug ac epidemic among juveniles and adults, as we all know. Um, what you may not know is with juveniles, it's about spice and huffing and alcohol. Those are the drugs that they are seeking. Um, yes, the juvenile court does have a drug court program. I believe the structure is fine. How it's being run by the current administration isn't working. Um, again, when I was the felony prosecutor, uh, I don't know how many times I would see adults come into felony court that would have extensive juvenile records regarding drugs and that has to be addressed it has to something has to change uh, with that um, because it, it just is isn't working we have to promote a, accountability for the children as well as their parents and that's not being done right now um, uh, it, it just it simply isn't so that uh, drugs, definitely a, a, a big, big issue. Also, another issue is technology. And by that, I mean everyone has cell phones, even in middle school and high school. And they're doing what we call sexting, texting back and forth um, dirty things to each other. And that's a big thing. And it makes children become 
uh, juvenile sex offenders. So these are two big issues that we need to focus on um, to try to uh, help our community because it is affecting our community in a big way. Is it possible I could have the last 30 to 45 seconds of my prior answer? No, sir. I'm sorry. Okay. Judge Ronk has said that law enforcement does not take juvenile crime as serious as adult crime. Do you agree or disagree with this statement, and do you feel the court system takes juvenile crime seriously? If elected, can you tell us how you approach the seriousness of juvenile crime? And Ms. Springer. Thank you. Um, I'm very pro-law enforcement. I worked closely with them for eight and a half years. They put their lives on the line every day for us. Um, juveniles need to respect law enforcement. I believe that's not happening now. When I, I practice in juvenile court right now, when the magistrate or judge walks in, no one stands up, no one treats it seriously. Um, and I believe that parlays into not treating uh, law enforcement seriously. If I'm elected judge, two of my main concerns will be to bring respect back to the court and that it should be treated as a court. It is a courtroom. Yes, juveniles are treated differently in, in that we look at the best interest of the child and it's not um, seen as a, it is in the adult realm, but also law enforcement needs to be respected. It's not being respected right now. So um, there would be mechanisms put in place in order to have that happen. Mr. Williams. Well, I don't know. I don't know who doesn't respect law enforcement other than kids and some of the parents we deal with, because it certainly isn't the juvenile court. They're an integral part of what we do in the probate juvenile court. We would be lost without law enforcement, and we try our best to make sure that, you know, we work in tandem, that, that law enforcement knows what to do when a child is taken into custody, who to call, those kinds of practical day-in and day-out things. As, as, as far as generating respect in the court, if uh, standing up in the court is the sole criteria, then uh, we could do that. We could hire a bailiff that would come in the door and say, all rise, and at what expense to the taxpayers. We pride ourselves in the probate juvenile court of being a little bit laid back in terms of procedure, but I can tell you one thing. When the child walks out the door at the probate juvenile court, they don't think it's any joke. I want to just touch on one other thing. I, I have to. I'm sorry. Um, we talk about juveniles going to uh, going upstairs. Uh, I don't think it's any surprise to anybody that we don't fix every kid that comes in our door. But we have a drug court program. There's an outstanding program. It has a success rate of 75 to 80 percent. And how you define success in drug court? No, not every child graduates from drug court. Sometimes children are so broken before we get them that there's only so much we can do. But I can tell you one thing. During the time that they're in their program, they have consumed a heck of a lot less drugs, or whatever it is, than they might have otherwise. And as far as accountability of parents, every parent in drug court is accountable. Parents are randomly screened. If they test positive for any illegal substance, they're referred to the Freedom Center. They're required to undergo assessment and treatment. If they fail to do that, they're subject to the contempt power of the court. Your time is up, sir. Thank you. Okay. For those who may not be familiar with what happens in the juvenile probate court, um, is it the responsibility of a juvenile judge to decide if a child should be removed from parental custody due to abuse or neglect issues? And in your view, is it better to remove a child from a troubled home or facilitate counseling for the family? Mr. Williams. The answer to the question, the first question is yes, it's a responsibility of the judge or magistrate to determine whether or not a child should be removed from the home. And I'm sorry to say I can't give you any pat answer. It's based on every case is different, the nature and the extent of the abuse or neglect, the parents, where are they at, are they, are they drug addicted. There's so many questions, so many issues, facts that go into that equation to determine whether or not it's, it's better to take a children out of the home. I firmly believe that children are absolutely entitled to a safe and healthy environment. And to go back to the end of my answer on drug court, 
the, the parents are subject to the contempt power of the court. If they fail to comply, we can and have removed children from the home. They are entitled to a, a safe, drug-free, nonviolent uh, environment. And if parents pan can't pass muster, then we can remove them from the home. They have to work a case plan through Children's Services. No, I'm not an advocate of pulling kids out of the home willy-nilly or wholesale, but there are many instances when you have to protect the child. And that's what, th that's what our court is there to do, is protect children. Ms. Springer. Thank you. Yes, I agree with uh, Mr. Williams. The, the court um, has to look at everything on a case-by-case -case basis because nothing is the same. No, no two cases are alike in, in any form or fashion. Um, you know, the court works uh, very closely with Children's Services. They do a great job. They have one of the toughest jobs on the planet in that they have to do things <coughs> that are um, difficult, that pull apart families, um, and they're doing it to help children. Um, but again, there needs to be more um, cohesive teamwork between the court, children's services, guardian ad litems who um, look out for the best interests of the child, and, and those, those people in order to um, see what happens and whether or not to pull a child from a home. Um, yes, it's always great to have a child stay with their parents. However, if that's not feasible due to any um, violence or drugs or some other thing that's going on, then um, I think the court needs to look more, more so to um, foster parenting and things of that nature, respite and that, that kind of thing. Thank you. We have touched on this uh, in a number of ways tonight so far, talking about the juveniles and parents. And most of, and both of you said that uh, the parenting is, is a big role in this. Uh, more specifically, how can the judge or magistrate make parents of these troubled youth more accountable in specific ways? Um, and if, if, you, if you can expound on that a little bit, that would be appreciated. Thank you. And let's start with Ms. Springer. Thank you. I have practiced both in, in the juvenile court, both as juvenile prosecutor, as well as guardian ad litem, an attorney advocate, and also attorney in a, an abuse neglect dependency case. Parents must be held accountable. There's ways the court can do that, through contempt, through making them uh, do certain programs and all that, and the court does do this, but it's not enough. Um, I've heard many times in, in practicing in the juvenile court, well, the next time I see you, juvenile, or mom or dad or whoever, then this is going to happen. We need to be firm and do things now. Letting, giving people a lot of rope to, to, to do things with is not, is not happening. It's not, it's not working. Um, so it has to be done immediately, immediate consequences. If a parent doesn't do a program like the parent project or, or, or what have you or, or whatever program they're required to do if they miss something, they need to be held accountable immediately. I ha in my experience, I haven't seen that happen. If I were elected a uh, probate juvenile judge, there would be uh, parental and juvenile accountability, and it would be immediate. Thank you. Such as what, if I could ask, what kind of penalty for the parent? Again, you can hold the parent in contempt for um, disobeying a court order and send them to jail um, or do other things that um, look into, you know, again, it's a case-by-case -case basis. So, um, but there has to be, it can't just be a threat. Uh, it's like threat, threatening a child with something and never doing it. They don't listen. Okay. Mr. Williams? Well, the only thing that I have to say is that's what's happening in juvenile court today. I don't think Mrs. Springer has been around in juvenile court for some time, but uh, parents don't attend the parent project, they get a contempt citation. Uh, that, that's really the power of the court, is, is to hold parents in contempt, or if we find based on a set of facts, is remove the children from the home. But again, you don't want to put the kids in the middle. You want the parents to comply. But folks, I, I'm just going to suggest to you, it, it's, not, it's just not as easy as one, two, three. Uh, we have, shall we say, in our, in our fine community, we have many different cultures. And we have some cultural things that we have to overcome where parents think certain things are important and certain things aren't, like education. 
Those, those are the kind of things that we, we do battle with every day, every week. Uh, so yes, holding parents accountable, absolutely. I think I gave you the example about drug court. Uh, that's the best we can do. I mean, there's a limit to what the law allows us to do. But given the, given the right factual setting, we can order the parents to do quite a few different things. But again, it has to be based on facts. I can't just wave my scepter and say, I want you to do this or I want you to do that. So we, ha we have to follow the laws as it's written and do the best we can with what we have. The number of county residents with mental health issues continues to rise with few local resources available. What experience do you have that prepares you to handle youth with mental health issues and probable cases of involuntary commitments of the mentally ill? Mr. Williams. Uh, my experience in juvenile court dealing with children with mentally ill uh, is, is significant. Um, I formerly worked at Orient State Institute in Orion, Ohio. Uh, the, and I don't, know, I don't know what the answer is. When I first started at the court, uh, we deal with kids going out drinking beer, smoking pot, uh, breaking, getting into fights and breaking into cars, stealing CDs. In the last five, six, seven, eight years, the incidence of children, and I mean children as young as eight, nine, with moderate to severe mental health issues has simply skyrocketed. And if I knew the answer as to why, I probably wouldn't have to run for this job. I would retire in some cushy spot. But that's not the issue. What we have done, and you're exactly right, the, there's a paucity of mental health services in this county. It just is not enough, anywhere near enough, to fill the need. What we have done in, 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 in our spirit of collaboration with the court is we have uh, contracted with Village Network and we have two clinical therapists on staff that both do evaluation and counseling. That is our response to an increasing mental health uh, docket. Uh, a mental health court has been discussed. We have one probation officer that deals with pretty much his caseload is mental health. Kids with moderate to severe mental health issues. So I, I really wish I knew the answer. And given the resources that we have and what's available to us in collaboration, that's where we are today. Thank you. Ms. Springer? Thank you. One of the things that shocked me the most when I started out as juvenile prosecutor uh, was the fact of how many children presented with schizophrenia, bipolar, depression, um, all sorts of uh, mental health issues. That was shocking to me. I, I didn't realize that at the time. Um, yes, there has to be a collaboration. A mental health court, um, if I'm elected judge, a mental health court will definitely be um, discussed and uh, see what the, the possibilities are there because there are more and more children, juveniles with mental health issues um, than, than ever before and it has to be dealt with because um, it, it, it's, it, it's so, it, it, it affects everything else. It affects what they're doing if they're doing delinquent acts or if they're having trouble in the home or if they're having trouble at the school or what have you. Um, and you know, relying on the resources, the fine resources that we have here in Knox County um, you know, it is, is tremendous. I don't think we need to have someone actually on our payroll to do that, um, but, you know, uh, collaborating with uh, different uh, mental health facilities um, is definitely necessary. Thank you. To change the subject a little bit, can you describe for the voters under what circumstances a resident of Knox County might end up before you if elected in probate court? I think people think, oh, if my will is contested, I'll be in probate court. Um, can you just talk about why someone would be before you in, in probate court? And uh, Ms. Springer, can you go first? Thank you. Yes. Um, yeah, m probate court seems to be a mysterious place for most people and one that's not um, talked about a lot. but. Um, 
a real world example of how a probate court could affect you, the citizens of Knox County, would be this. Um, and one of the, you know, we're, we're a rural community, a farming community. There's a lot of beautiful farms here in Knox County. Um, so one of the many big, biggest, one of the biggest challenges facing many Knox Co County families is preserving um, and passing on family farms. Um, that process is overseen by the probate court. And if the farm passes by your will, or even if you have a trust, disputes could rise for years after uh, a person's death. So yes, you know, when you pass away and your assets and, and that, that kind of thing, the probate court would oversee that. Mr. Williams. Okay, the question again, how, how would Just, uh, citizens be affected by the probate how would they, court? How could they, why would they end up in probate court before you, if elected? Well, if, uh, number one, if they're seeking to adopt a child. Um, uh, adoptions are a, a jurisdiction of the probate division. Uh, we have uh, uh, certainly a state administration <clears throat> and estates, uh, the executor, other, other heirs or legatees that are interested in the estate may come into our court. Uh, but once the will is filed, for example, we're pretty much left with what what the planning was prior to the passing of the decedent. So we are there to administer the estate under the guise of the administrator. We are not there to create tax savings or estate savings. The other area that, that the probate court comes under, if you want to change your name, uh, and the one that's most common is, is guardianship of incompetence. People that uh, are, have lost or are losing the ability to care for themselves, to manage their own affairs, those are all areas that are dealt with in, in the probate arena. Thank you. People's earnings and lifetime of acquiring assets, including property, are of the utmost importance. We touched on it briefly there. At the time of a death, many families can be torn over these possessions and who they now belong to. If this family in a flurry of emotion and passion was in your court today, kind of tell us how it would look in your courtroom. Uh, how would you uh, walk through a hearing like this? Mr. Williams. Ah. Well, before going on the record, what I would do is sit down with the heirs and, and, and the interested parties and see if any kind of resolution could be reached. So try to determine what the issues are and see if there's a middle path that they can garner. Just like in a custody case, the decisions that the parents reach as between the two of them, as far as their children are concerned, are usually preferable to the decisions that I, as a complete stranger to that action, may make. But having said that, those folks are entitled to their day in court. And if that's what they want, that's what they're going to receive. And I'm going to take the evidence, listen carefully and attentively, and make the uh, fair and impartial decision based on the uh, existing law. Um, but again, you try, to, you, you try to get people to resolve matters almost, I don't want to say mediation, but you explain the, explain the law to them and here are some likely results. These are, the, these are some of the costs involved. What do you want to do? You know, sometimes you just ask them, what are we really fighting over? So, but again, they're always entitled. Every citizen, when they file a complaint, is entitled to their, their day in court. So, thank you. Okay. Ms. Springer. I believe I can't. Um elaborate any further on uh, Mr. Williams' uh, response, and I, I think that's exactly what should happen in, in that situation. Thank you. This question comes from a reader. Uh, the reader wanted to say that um, they believe that Podville is a model that's used in the county um, is an area of teen discipline. Um, they want to know... Is an area of... Teen discipline. Okay. Is that correct? I guess I should start there. Did you Is say that teen? teen? Teen, like youth. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Juvenile. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. So they want to know if you feel that facing a wall for hours is beneficial, and please share your thoughts regarding this behavior model, and if you believe there are more resourceful opportunities available for youth assigned to the program. And Miss Springer. Thank you. 
again, in my experience as juvenile prosecutor, um, I, I don't believe Podville is the most effective use of our resources. You have to have a probation staff or some, some staff member basically babysit these juveniles um, when they sit and look at a wall for four hours. Um, and I believe, again, it's, it, it's not working. So we need to look at different things, um, different um, punishments, if you will, um, for these, uh, an alternative to Podville. Um, I'm not an expert in, um, you know, what makes juveniles tick and what doesn't, but I, I know that uh, juveniles that I've talked to, um, especially uh, being a, a defense attorney as I am now, um, they find it to be a joke. So um, I don't want to waste taxpayers' dollars um, with uh, having them watch these juveniles for hours at a time, and usually it's in four-hour increments. Uh, so there, there should be different, more effective ways to um, quote-unquote punish juveniles, uh, more community service. Let's give back to the community. Let's have these juveniles do something for our community. If they've done something that's a delinquent act, if committed by an adult, then they should give back to the community rather than to sit and face the wall or basically sit in a corner for four hours or however long it is. So that, that's my, my uh, position on that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Williams. Podville was uh, begun a number of years ago and it had a very specific purpose punishment by boredom and quite frankly when we talk about the fiscal responsibility and being good stewards of the taxpayer dollar we pay one sometimes two people to watch any one of a number of kids in Podville detention which was why Podville was created as an alternative to detention detention costs us ninety to a hundred dollars a day per child you do the math I'm going to tell you, if you talk to the folks at Mount Vernon High School, they're going to tell you that they think Podville is a wonderful thing because we have what's called the 2-4 plan. Two hours for each tardy, four hours for each unexcused absence. And I get calls from the school officials. Uh, they said they can tell right away when we're not strictly enforcing Podville, if that's the case, or they're not communicating with us uh, because all of a sudden the absence rate starts to skyrocket. It's very effective in ensuring uh, attendance. Would we like uh, other things? We certainly would. If we had the money and the staff, there's a lot of things we can do. Uh, for example, one thing that I think a number of us, Judge Ronk and myself, have talked about for years is a, is a really structured community service program. I mean, focused. I mean, there's a lot of people. The Park District, the Cocosin Gap Trail, there's a lot of places that kids could generate uh, their efforts. But it takes money. It takes staff. Therein lies the problem. So we have, we have uh, gone the median course, if you will. We're trying to get the, if you will, the best bang for our buck. Some kids hate Podville. Other kids, you send them to detention, they could care less. It's a free weekend, three squares. I'm out of the home. I don't have to listen to mom. It's great. It's kid dependent. Each kid is different. Thank you. Um, what kind of qualities would you look for in a magistrate, if elected, and do you have someone already in mind for that position? Mr. Williams? I would, <laughs> I would look for the most uh, competent individual I can, I can find, someone with experience uh, in a wide variety of juvenile issues, particularly custody, visitation, and child support, which is a huge docket in our court. Um, but as far as who, um, Personally, I think it is uh, premature and inappropriate to discuss any potential staff changes prior to the election. Those things will come. Ms. Springer? Um, same with me. Uh, obviously, I'm not thinking, uh, you know, you have someone in mind in theory. However, um, it, it is premature at this point prior to actually winning the election. Someone I would look for in a magistrate would be someone with experience. I believe trial experience is very important because you understand the rules of evidence, the rules of juvenile procedure, criminal procedure, civil procedure, depending on what you're dealing with. That's very important. 
um, and dealing with, uh, with the court. Uh, and I would also look for someone with uh, my judicial philosophy as well, a similar judicial philosophy, so that we could work together, work with a, a staff, and uh, do what's best for the citizens of Knox County. Thank you. As administrator, and we'll start with you, Mr. Williams, as administrator or a judge, uh, is there anything that you would do differently administratively in the department that you could see um, would, would better improve where, where it's at right now? Administratively. Well, one of the, one of the areas, quite frankly, in terms of, uh, I'll just say that Judge Ronk and I share the same vision with regard to children and families of our county. Um, we, we do, however, have different management styles. Mine is more direct. Um, one of the areas that I would like to look at is the probation department to increase the efficiency, professionalism, and accountability. Those are the folks that deal directly with the kids. That's where, that's where we're going to make a difference for next year, five years from now, ten years from now with the children in our county who are going to be the adults, the young adults and adults in our county. So, to me, that's, that's a critical portion of the program. One of the, one of the other things that's often said, and it, it, I find it kind of irritating, is that uh, the juvenile court is described as having a bloated staff. Well, that, that's a matter of opinion. Uh, when you compare the juvenile court to the common pleas court upstairs, Judge Eister's court, um, they, have, they have a small staff but they don't do the same kind of work and certainly don't do the same kind of volume of work that we do in the juvenile court. They also have Joe Hawkins, our clerk of courts, and her staff over there that does all the administrative and paperwork uh, processing for them. We don't have that luxury. We have to employ our own deputy clerks to do that very same function. So when you're looking at those kinds of things, you have to compare apples and apples and oranges and oranges. Um, I don't think there's a whole lot of fat to be cut. Can we do some things differently? Oh, sure we can, and I'm not going to go into that here today. I think that's premature, but we're always looking to be good stewards of the taxpayer's dollar. Thank, Thank you. you. Ms. Springer, anything you'd like to add to your earlier statements? Yes. Um, Again, when you look at municipal court and what they deal with and the volume that they deal with, with three probation officers, um, again, we need to evaluate, reevaluate what's going on with the personnel, probation, um, policies, and, and that type of thing. Um, so it is an apples to apples comparison because I believe the municipal court has a much bigger volume of cases than the juvenile court would. And again, the juvenile court does different things, obviously, um, than a municipal court would do, a municipal court probation officer would do. However, um, I, I would definitely look at the personnel and uh, figure out what's going on with that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to our closing statements at this point. Um, you folks have been really gracious and have used your time allotment. So we're going to give you three minutes for your closing statements instead of two. Uh, I'm sure that you will still won't have enough time, but that's okay. Um, Mr. Williams, you can start. Thank you. And despite what you may think, it has been a pleasure to be here tonight because there's few things I like better than talking about the probate juvenile court. Um, uh, Mrs. Springer talked about uh, 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 municipal court, and I'm sorry to say we've got to compare apples to apples. I, I believe, I uh, it freely admit, municipal court has a huge, huge caseload, as do we. But again, similar to the, similar, they are in the adult system. What do they do? They get, the person gets put on probation, and they have to check in with their probation officer once a week or once a month, go to the Freedom Center, do this, do that, but they, that's it. We run programs for kids. We run programs that are specifically designed to enhance the chance of success for each child. And each child is different. So you have to treat them differently. Again, you've heard about drug court. I won't go into that. It's our most intensive program last nine months to 12 months, sometimes two years. We run CYP, the community youth program, for 
for young men and FFY, the Female Fitness for Youth program. It's a combination of physical fitness, guest speakers come in on safe dating practices, communicable diseases, what have you, things that are topically of interest to juveniles. We have the study table program that is designed to help academically at-risk kids succeed at school. We want them to be at Mount Vernon or East Knox or wherever it is. We don't want them to be in the Learning Center. And in the spirit of collaboration, we have students from Kenyon and the Nazarene that come in and tutor. That does two things. Number one, academically, I think you can appreciate that a college student's going to be able to do a pretty good job. It also deals with the interrelationship between that student and the child. These children are being exposed to someone that they might otherwise never be exposed to. There is life beyond Knox County. I'm going to close by, say, by saying my wife and I have raised two teenage children, which uh, I think we can all agree is not an easy task and has given me a, a certain empathy for some of the parents that come into my court. Frankly, what's at stake in this election is the health, safety, and welfare of the children and families of this community. This election is not about political affiliation. This election is about children and families. I believe I have enjoyed in my campaign thus far, amazingly enough, significant bipartisan support which I'm very pleased. And I believe that I have the vision, the experience, and certainly the drive to serve the children and families of Knox County as the judge of the probate juvenile court for the next six years. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. You only went over by a little bit. <laughs> okay, thank you. Ms. Springer. Thank you very much. And again, I want to thank everyone for being here tonight. This warms my heart that so many of you have come here to uh, listen to both the commissioner debate as well as uh, the probate juvenile judge debate, and um, that, that's a good thing. Um, I want to provide continuity to the court, but I also think it's time for a fresh set of eyes on the probate juvenile court. Things have been the same for the last 20 years. Um, it's time for, for a new set of eyes to look at the policies, the personnel, the infrastructure, the technology of that, that court, that office, and to see what can be done differently, um, what, what is working, what may not be working, and to provide the best um, value for our taxpayer dollars, which I think we can all agree um, is very important. I've been seeking this position for a very long time. Um, this has been my goal. This is what, this is my dream job, so to speak, because I care for children, um, as, as I'm sure all, all you do. Um, I have two little boys, and I want the same thing for my children that I would want for the children of Knox County. I want them to have a safe community, a healthy environment, to uh, be to be safe in their homes, to do well in school. I want to help schools. I want to work with children's services and other community organizations to work together to help all to our children because they are the future of our, our community. And again, I, I really appreciate your support. I appreciate you listening to both of us tonight. I really respect Mr. Williams. Um, and, and his thoughts, um, but I do, I would appreciate your vote on November 4th. Thank you again very much. Thank you, candidates. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just have a couple of quick housekeeping um, kind of things. We want to thank the Mount Vernon City Schools for generously providing this building for